Paul's letter to the Colossians, because um, that's really what we're doing. We're just walking through this short letter that the Apostle Paul wrote, um, and it's a little different than we, we would normally walk through something like this, um, but I hope that it's been meaningful, that it's been helpful, um, but as always, my goal is to try to give us some homework to help make it somewhat practical as well, and so we've been walking through Paul's letter to the Colossians. It's four chapters, um, so it's pretty short, but he's specifically addressing uh, some key issues, some cultural pressures that were happening there in this Greco-Roman city of Colossae. And it's similar to pressures that we still face to this day, but um, for them, it, he wrote this, and I said this the first week, it's kind of like putting on a pair of reading glasses. It's like Colossians is like a, a, a pair of reading glasses because it brings clarity to some of the issues that they were struggling with. And this was brand new. This was fledgling, you know, this idea of, of being a follower of Jesus, a follower of the way. It was, it was still new. It was just a few decades old when Paul is writing. He's actually writing from a Roman prison, or at least he was under house arrest. And he's, he had found out from a guy named Epaphras that, um, that you know, things were great and there was reason to, to be excited about what was happening uh, in, uh, in Colossae, but there were some, you know, some pressures. There were some issues, some things going on. And um, these cultural pressures is what Paul then turns around and addresses, and it's for you and me as well. And here's the, and here, basically, like, and this is like in a nutshell, basically what Paul encourages them to do, challenges them to do, is to deepen their faith and their confidence and their commitment and their devotion to Jesus. You want to know how we should in our day to day, how we should handle and deal with cultural pressures that we face and temptations that we face? And it's not by compromise. It's also not by getting out on the street and yelling at people and telling them they're going to hell. Do you know how we do that? The same way Paul encouraged the Colossians. Deepen your commitment and your devotion to Jesus. If you'll do that, you, you will be, be able to deal with those temptations as they come, and it will make a difference in the way that you live your life and the way that people see what is happening. And so the bottom line for this entire series, of course, is Jesus is enough. It's the understanding that what, Jesus, what was really being challenged that Paul addresses is the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus, that he is the supreme being, that he really is divine, he really is God. That was being challenged. It was causing people to kind of look a different direction, and so this was the, those reading glasses. No, this is really who Jesus is. He really is God. But then also the sufficiency of Jesus, that what he did on the cross was enough. That what he accomplished for you and me when he conquered sin and death, that it was enough. You don't have to add anything to it. There's no supplements. There's, no, uh, there's nothing that we have to add to Jesus. Jesus really is enough. He's enough for our eternity, and he's enough for the life that we live today. I mean, that's all of this in a nutshell. And so here's what I've given us some homework over the last few weeks, last couple of weeks. And so we're going to do that each week. But here's what I asked you to do last week. One of the things that I asked you to do was to memorize these statements. Because this is kind of like, if you wanted to summarize where we were last week, it would look something like this. Jesus is above all. He has done it all. Now I have it all. So I won't move at all. Jesus is above all. He's outside of all things. It's the statement that he is supreme, that he is divine. And he has done it all. He is sufficient. He has accomplished everything. And so now that I'm in Christ and now that I've chosen to receive the gift that he has given me, now I've got it all. I've got all I need. I don't need religion. I don't need rules. I don't have to follow certain decrees or rituals or commands. It's not like that. I, it's, it's, it's not that kind of religion. It's relationship. And so I've got it all already and it's in Jesus. And so I won't move at all. In other words... I'm going to keep my gaze, my eyes, and my attention fixed on Jesus. I'm going to keep clear about what I see and who Jesus is. And so that's where we were last week. So, and this is what I've done each of the last couple of weeks. Is I've, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. And so I like to, like even with four chapters, I like to see some chunks. You know, like I, I like to take things bite-sized a little bit. Is anybody else more that way? It's like... I. I like seeing the big picture, but then again, I kind of like 
I like chapters and I like verses. Anybody with me? I mean, have you ever tried to read it? There are um, versions available where they eliminate all the chapters and verses, all the numbers, and you just read it like it was a letter. And it's like, oh, I kind of like the chapters and verses. It breaks it up a little bit. Well, this is the way I, I break up some of these chapters and verses. And so these are the first three. What, and, and again, this isn't a right or wrong thing, okay? This is just my kind of my interpretation um, of how this would break up in a simple way. There's other ways to, to do this. I would encourage you to kind of find your own way. So chapters 1, 1 through 14, chapter 1, 15 through 20, and chapter 1, 21 through chapter 2, 5. And so that's where we were last week. We've done that um, over the last couple of weeks. Again, we're not literally going through every single verse, but these are the kind of the broad sections that we're walking through here. Today, today, we're going to walk through... Oh, I don't know what that was. I broke a bone. Chapter 2, verses 6 through the end of the chapter, 23. Um, and really, so again, I like, I like things in chunks a little bit. And so I decided this week, because this kind of bogs down a little bit, you know, Paul um, probably didn't, you know, I, I said this the first week, he, did, he wasn't just sitting down necessarily writing, he was probably dictating these letters, and so somebody was, you know, recording this as he was going, going along, and so he gets a little, you know, a little long-winded and repeats himself and goes in circles, and then he'll say one thing and then kind of never comes back to it, and it's like, uh, you, know, and it, you know, that doesn't make any sense, and, and he is the king of run-on sentences too. Like, there's some long ones, you know. And so I like, again, to, to break it up a little bit. And so here is my breakdown. And this is like the, 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 uh, the flyover of where we're going to be today. And so if this helps, and I encourage you to take notes. We, is the paper in the seats today? Do we? Nah. Oh, it is? <laughs> Look at that. So if you're a note taker, and I encourage you to be one, um, maybe you're a phone note taker. That's fine, too. Um, I encourage you to, to at least write some things down. It just helps, like, it helps me anyway. It helps things stick a little bit. And so chapter 2, verse 6 through 23 is this whole thing now. So I've kind of, I'm, now I'm taking it like, you know, zooming in. Verse 6 and 7 is what I would call a core conviction for the entire letter. To me, I, th I think this is like a summary, a, a great way to summarize the whole letter, if you will. It's like a core conviction is kind of the way I put it. And then Verse 8 is like a quick summary, uh, like a flyby um, of the, these temptations, these pressures that the Colossians were feeling. So that's what is addressed real quickly. And then 9 through 15 is what Jesus has done for you. And he goes into all, again, he's like, he's reiterating himself a little bit, but he details. And, and the reason is because what he does here is like the pivotal passage for what is to come. So he's kind of set the, set the foundation the last couple of weeks. Today, in this passage, is like the, is like the pivot point. It's like a hinge pin it, it, to me. Um, and, and, and it sets us up for chapters 3 and 4, which is all about how we should live in response to this. And so today... We get this section here that's like, here's what Jesus has done for you. And then he encourages us in the last little section of this section, subsection, whatever. So don't submit. So do not submit to anything but Jesus. Because of what he's done for you, don't submit to anything but Jesus. And then next week we get into like, and so here's how you should live as a result. But, but this is a really, this is crucial that we get this right. We're going to, we're going to get into some details a little bit. Again, it's not going to be every verse, but I, I, I want to highlight some things that I think are super, super important about this. And I think it's going to, uh, I think it could be pivotal in your own life as well. So let's jump in, verse 6, and we'll just stop here. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord. Now, I'm stopping there because the word Lord um, is, is the Greek word kurios, okay? And I'm not going to say it like, because like, I listened to some of them online. It's like, oh, kurios, you know, I'm just not going to, kurios, you know. Um, it means Lord or Master. Shows up 16 times in just Colossians. But around 700, 740 times, I think it is. I don't remember exactly. All across the New Testament. And the majority of the time, 
it refers to Jesus. In other words, it, it, it's referring to Jesus as Lord, that Jesus is Lord. Okay, so, so this word is really important, um, and it, it's, it's suggesting that Jesus, without him specifically saying it, by using the word Lord in reference to Jesus, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, notice he doesn't say Savior there, he says as you, you've received him as Lord, in other words, Jesus is the supreme being. He is the one who is in charge of everything, he controls everything, he is the one who is above everything, and so he is worthy of our respect, our adoration, and our reverence. He is the supreme authority under which we are to live our lives. All of that is encapsulated in this word, Lord. Jesus is Lord. Now, here's why that's really important, because sometimes I think we, we confuse or, you know, like, we treat the word Savior and Lord like they're synonymous, and they're just not. But, and I think it's because, like, even in our culture, I, th I thought about athletes today. You know, anytime they get a microphone, and if they, you know, if they have Aunt Judy, who is, like, in church, and they know, like, I told him if he ends up on a microphone that he better give credit where credit is due. And so they get on that microphone, and what do they say? They, they say, well, first of all, I just want to give all the credit to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, or let me, just, let me just point all the attention to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard that before? My Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we just kind of, it just rolls off the tongue. Well, he's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's like, and it's like Lord and Savior, the same thing, but they're not at all. Savior is maybe in reference to our eternity. Lord has to do with our now. It's our life. It's like he is the Lord of our now, not just our later. He's the Lord of like right now. And here's the difference too. And this is in my, and again, in my words, but check this out. To acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your Savior and your Lord is to say that he is in control of your life as well as your eternity. That's an important distinction. If you're a believer or if you're considering becoming a follower of Jesus, I, you need to know this, that there is a distinction between what we're saying when, he, when we're saying we're receiving him as our Savior, but, but, but we're also receiving him as our Lord. It's so important. And we're going to get into that over the course of this message, but I just don't want, let me just, I'm just kind of setting the bar a little bit. I don't want us to miss this. And so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, Again, this is what I would call the core conviction for the whole, you know, for the whole uh, letter. Since you received him as Lord, not Savior, Lord, the one who is over your life in authority, continue to live your lives, not like, you know, continue to reflect on eternity and what, no, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and that, that's kind of a, a bit of a jab. It's kind of a reminder. Colossians, don't, Christians, don't you remember? Don't you remember what you were taught? Epaphras kind of led this thing in, in, in Colossae, and he got this, this, this small group of believers going, and he taught you some of this stuff. That's the faith you need to be strengthened in and then overwhelming with thankfulness. In other words, when you make Jesus your Lord, the only reason that you would be willing to do that is because you recognize just how thankful you are for what he has done. If you're not really, really aware of what God has done through sending his son, Jesus, then you're not going to have a whole lot of gratitude, which means you're probably not really making him your Lord. Now, we're going to come back to this at the end, and so we'll circle back around in a minute. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive, watch this, through hollow and deceptive philosophy. And this is the one where I think there's kind of two, you know, he's kind of highlighting these temptations. Don't let anybody take you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Why? Because when you're paying attention to something else, you're not paying attention to Jesus. And that's the whole thing. You know, they're, they're supposed to be looking this way, but they've kind of, they're getting distracted. They're looking in a little bit different direction because, you know, they're being tempted. They're being baited. 
It's like, it's not just Jesus. There's some other stuff. Throw Jesus into the mix, but it's other stuff. In other words, human tradition would represent like all of that, re the religion that we get caught up in. It's the rules, the regulations, the commands, the Torah, in this case, for some of them, following the rituals. Do, like, don't let that... It, it, when you, get ca you become captivated by things that are what you can do on your own and accomplish on your own, it takes your eyes off Jesus and it means what Jesus did wasn't enough. And the elemental spiritual forces, he's just, he's just kind of referencing there the, um, this gre Greco-Roman culture that, that these people have grown up in, that the Colossian Christians grew up with, this idea you know, that, that really everything's spiritual and everything is kind of attached to some sort of spirituality and some like a God kind of element. And so, you know, therefore, there, there's things that we have to do to appease the gods and there's things, you know, there's just all the ritual things I have to say and do and I got to get this right and, you know, beat myself and flog myself and, you know, all, I sac you know, like I... I give things up because it's going to put me in better standing. And that's what, really what he's talking about. And all of those things, well, we'll get, that, get to that in just a second. This was just an overview, though. Okay. Then, then we begin this next uh, little section, 9 through 15. But verses 9 and 10 are really important. I want, I want to highlight these. For in Christ, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Here's my version of that. Jesus really is God, okay? That's what, it's like, why didn't Paul just say it that way? I don't know. Like, because he was smarter than me. That's why he says stuff like this. That really Jesus was the fullness of God. And in Christ, in other words, when you've been taken out of Adam and placed into Christ, we were born in Adam, born in sin, but now we've, when you receive what Jesus has done for you and accomplished, now you've been placed into Christ. And when that happens, you have been brought to fullness. In other words, what's true of Christ is now true of you. The wholeness that is Christ is now true of you. It's not perfection, but you are made complete because your relationship with God has been restored. Okay, so that's that fullness. He is, watch this, the head over every power and authority. The head kind of... What he, we, we talked about this last week. He makes this reference to Jesus being the head of the church and the church being the body of Christ. And those two things go together. And he is an authority over the church. He is the head, but he's also the head over every... This is what he's saying here. This is kind of why it's different. He is the head, Jesus, over every power and authority. In other words, over everything, including you and me. He's the head. Now, he comes back to that in just a minute, and he kind of references it. But, but then, in this, through, through the rest of this, through verse 15, and, and you can read this for yourself. He go, we'll, we'll highlight a little bit of it. But he's just basically talking about, here's what Jesus did as the head. The one who has earned respect and has earned his position of authority over everything else, this is what he has done. And here's kind of a, a summary of it. When you were dead in your sins... When you couldn't respond to him on your own, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. In other words, the cross was the end-all, be-all. The cross was the final touch. The cross was the accomplishment. The, the cross was the work. The cross finished it, and then his ultimate resurrection that followed that, but he has done it. He has accomplished it. And then we get into this next section, and it begins with this word, therefore. And I heard, it was probably a preacher or somebody told me a long time ago, he said, anytime you see this word, therefore, he said, what came before it tells you what comes after it is therefore. It's like, oh, okay. So, this tells you what it's, what it's all there for. In other words, this is what, what I just told you. Everything that I've explained at this point, this is the foundation. This is the reason why you should then listen to what I'm about to say. Therefore, because of what Jesus has done for you, because you've already received him as your Lord, therefore. And then he, he talks about these futile attempts, these 
empty obligations that we place on ourselves, that we try to, you know, in, in order for us to kind of get to God in our human traditions and our, you know, our own religious activities, and I go to church, and I check boxes, and I try to be good, and I'm a better husband today than I was yesterday, and I'm, you know, I'm setting goals, and I'm, I'm just, I'm doing it, I'm doing better. I've got this thing down, or I'm, you know, really paying attention to these spiritual forces around me, and I'm, you know, I'm, obligating myself to them and I want to make sure that they're happy with me because the Colossians, what we don't even understand, we can't even understand this, they lived in fear because everything around them needed to be appeased. I mean, the God of this, the God of that, like literally everything had, you know, they lived in fear because it was like, if I step out of line, if I do something wrong, I could die, I could get sick, I could lose a child, could lose our house, lose all of my career, my money, whatever. And so instead of all of that, therefore, this is what he points out. All of those things are just a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, though, in its fullness, the thing that, that maybe creates that shadow, however, is found in Christ. All of those things are, are our attempt. Those, those are our attempt at trying to get to God, making our lives better, fixing things on our own, Trying to, you know, uh, you know, it's like, well, today's Wednesday, but if by Friday I've done a couple of these things, God's probably going to be happy with me and things are going to be better. And then I mess up over the weekend. It's like, uh-oh, God's not happy with me. I need to fix some things. I need to do some things. All of that just takes your attention off of your heavenly father, takes your attention off of what Jesus did. And so it's just a shadow. Jesus is the reality. Jesus and what he accomplished is enough. It is all we need. And when we lose sight of this, this is, and this is him speaking through the generations to you and me, when we lose sight of this, like he's talking to the Colossians, he said, these are people who have lost connection with the head. From whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Let's take out that middle part. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body grows as God causes it to grow. I.e., you only grow as God causes you to grow when you're connected to the head, which is Christ, alone. We just sing about that. Jesus, you alone? It's Jesus, you alone. That's to say, Jesus, you're enough. You're my Savior, but you're also my Lord. You are everything to me. You're in charge. You're outside of all things. You've accomplished everything, and so I can trust you. I can lean into you 100%. And so only when I stay connected to you being the head can I, I've got to, and when I take my eyes off of Jesus and I make it about my obligations and the things that I'm doing and I'm, I'm doing better, you know, I've been, man, I've been reading my Bible and checking those boxes. I'm almost, you know, I've got 110 days of consistent, you know, opening the Bible app. And, you know, I've, I love seeing a little, bzz, you know, and it tells me I've opened my Bible app again. And it's like, we, we are so quick to lean on the wrong things and to make it about, well, I, I, I'm being really consistent at church, though, now. It's a good thing. That's, a good, that's a good stuff. Like, I listened. I took notes today. All of that, like, good stuff. I encourage you to do those things. But those are responses to your relationship with God. They're not what brings you into a relationship with God. When you make it about getting God to look in your direction or to lean in your direction, you've lost connection with the head. So now let's backtrack after we pick that up. That's, some, that's a mess. Oh, okay. Show is not here. We're going to go back to verses 6 and 7 again. So now let's read this with all of that in mind. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, not just your Savior, you received him as Lord, Continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. 
You notice these words, rooted and built up and strengthened, those aren't things that you actually can accomplish on your own. Those happen as a result of being connected to the head, who is Jesus, because he's Lord. These things happen. You are, you, you can't, you don't grow your own roots, okay? You just place yourself in a position where God grows those roots. You can't build yourself up. God builds you up, okay, because you're connected to the head. He's the one who grows the body. God causes the body to grow, which is what we just read. And we can't strengthen ourselves in the faith. That's what God does because we're connected to the head, who is Jesus. Because he, Why? Because he is Lord. And all that's well and good. That's awesome. But let me... If, if I could just pause for just a second, let me just, I'm going to talk specifically to those of you who are Christians here. You call yourself a Christian, you would say, yes, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. And let, me just, let me just ask you, if you're at home, maybe watching, listening later, uh, consider this for just a second. And this isn't a, a Jesus juke, this is a serious question. You've received Jesus as your Savior, but have you made him your Lord? This is an important distinction especially for cultural Christianity in today's world. Um, I think it's why so many people are willing to call themselves a Christian, but then not look like a Christian or not live their lives that way. It's like, ah, you know, I, I don't know what it is. It's like there's, there's, there's not a connection there. And it's like we lack a connection really with Jesus, our Savior, because we haven't made him our Lord. The question is, like, maybe, maybe you prayed that prayer and you remember that moment and you had that experience and you really did encounter Jesus and there was conviction and you professed Jesus as your Savior. But, but the question is, have you really made him your Lord? And, and here's the thing. That's a tough one to answer. And before you're, you know, too quick to that one, it's like, well, yeah. It's like, the, the initial question might be, well, what, what does that even look like? How do I even know? And this one's hard to distinguish. But, but if I can, if I may, if you'll let me, I want to see if I can support this with another letter real quick, just a couple of verses from another letter that Paul wrote addressing some of these very same issues, things that were getting in the way of their freedom in Christ. He was writing to the Galatian Christians and was actually in the same area, modern-day Turkey. And he's writing to the Christians in Galatia, which really was more like a general area than it was like a, a city or a town. Galatia was like a, a, an, an area, a province, a, you know. And so he's writing to these people, and in chapter 5 of Galatians, um, he's addressing th these very temptations, and, he, and here's what he says is the secret. This is the difference. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Another way to say that is stay connected to the head. Another way to say that is to make Jesus your Lord. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. In other words, well, well no, wait. I thought I was just supposed to try real hard not to do what my sinful nature craves. Well, how is that working for you? right? That's okay to say, like, ha, ha, ha. you know, because, like, I know, like, nobody's good at this. We can't do it on our own. There's just discouragement. Of course, then what do we do? <clears throat> it's what I address, like, my very first few sentences is this, is, like, we compromise. We, we dumb down the standard so that we can actually meet it. Instead of, instead of becoming more and more like Jesus and allowing him to guide our steps, we just kind of bring the standard down and say, oh, well, like I'm, well, I'm, I'm doing better than they are. We kind of look around the room. And it's like, well, as long as I'm, you know, better than 50%, it's kind of like, you know, if there's two of you in the woods, you don't have to be faster than the bear, just faster than the other person, you know, when it's chasing you. And it's the same idea. It's like, I don't have to be that good. I just got to be better than them. And that's what we begin to do. And we, think, and we evaluate our relationship with God based on, you know, what others' relationship with God must look like, based on some, some wrong standard. But Jesus is the standard. 
And to make him Lord is to let the Spirit, who is Jesus' Spirit living within us, guide your lives, not just secure your eternity. And then he says this, and when you do that, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit, and you've heard this before in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's like, that's awesome. But here's, what Paul, here, here's the thing. This fruit is what is produced in you, not by you. you this isn't a to-do list. We like this. Religious people look at that and go, praise God, that's what I came to church for. Can I just get a good amen? Like, that's what I've been looking for. I'm going to write that down, Pastor. Can you pause on that screen? Because I need to make a list. Matter of fact, I'm going to put it in alphabetical order. we got some type A folks in here. I'm going to put it in alphabetical order. I'm going to put a little circle beside each one of those, and I'm going to start checking those boxes. I'm literally going to be one of the best Christians. I'm going to be such a good Christian because I've got a list now. You know, I've got that teenage son that I'm dealing with. I've got a, you know, boss that's just driving me up the wall. I just, I, I need to know what I need to do. I've got to get some things accomplished. And Paul would say, I'm sorry, but that's not what you can do on your own. This is only what the Spirit can produce in you, and only if you're submitted to the Spirit and being guided by the Spirit. In other words, is Jesus your Lord? Since, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Now, that one's, it's, that one's going to get dicey here in just a second, okay? Since we're living by the Spirit, since we received Jesus Christ as our Lord, then follow His leading in every area of our lives. You see, the problem is that we... we um, we see a list like that, or we show up and we, we approach things as religious people because that sounds better, you know, because we like to know what to do. We, we, we become Christians. We receive Jesus as our Savior, and we say yes to Jesus, and I want to be a Jesus follower. I need to give my life to him. Yes, Lord, I am a sinner. I'm a mess, and I'm ready for you to change me from the inside out. We think, you know, those are kind of where we start. And then we immediately go, now, what do I need to do? What do I need to be working on? What do I need to fix? Could you give me that list again? You know, like, to show me some things that I need to be doing. And Paul would say, I'm sorry, there's nothing you can do. This isn't about you anymore. You are not the solution. The problem is, we don't really, we kind of fight, we, we push back against that. Isn't that true? A little bit. We don't like that. Why? You ready? Because it's easier to be religious than to live by the Spirit. It is easier to be a religious person than to really live according to the Spirit, to stay in step with the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit, to allow Jesus to really be your Lord, for Him to guide and direct your life. Like, that is, that is kind of out there. It doesn't have, you know, it's not like tangible. It's not quantifiable. It's like, but how do I know if I'm doing it? I don't want to know if I'm doing good. Like it's, I would, Let me just stick with some religious stuff because then I can you know, determine where I am on the measuring stick. Like I can know, you know, how am I adding up? You know, I'm looking around. But Paul would look at you and me and he would say, you are not the solution. Jesus is. Jesus is the solution. Jesus is the solution for your eternity but also for your life. Jesus, like this life, now. It's like, well, I've been a Christian for five years, and like things haven't gotten a whole lot better. Like I'm still struggling. You know, finances aren't real good. My marriage is on the rocks. You know, I'm still addicted. I'm still, you know, it's just not, my kids are going crazy. Hadn't talked to them in forever, you know. And when we think, you know, what, what difference did it make? And I would, I would wager that perhaps you've made him your Savior, but not your Lord. And because of that, you've taken your eyes off of Jesus and onto yourself and what you can do. And But I've been going to church. I've been trying to do these things. I've been reading my Bible more. I've been checking those boxes. And all that's well and good, but it does not accomplish anything 
if you're not connected to the head. So I got some homework, okay? And then we're going to get into th this homework, I, I hope, will help will help bring some clarity because this is one of those things that's just, it's not quantifiable. It's not easy to talk about. It's, it's, it's different for every single one of us. But here's what I know. Here's what I know. This is how you'll know. And again, this is very kind of, this is broad. Okay, I'm painting with a broad paintbrush, but it's the best I can do. Here's how you know that you're being led by the Spirit because you're going to get to the end of a day, to the end of a week, or maybe even the end of a year, and you're going to look back and you're going to think, wow, something's different. I wasn't even trying. I don't even, what happened? Like, I'm just different. Like, something's changed in me. And I didn't meet my goals. I didn't, my New Year's resolutions, you know, those are terrible. I didn't do real good with my Bible app. I missed church more than I wanted to, but, but something is different. And you know what's going to be different? In that moment, it will be a realization that in some way, in maybe a growing, maturing way, you are being led by the Spirit. I can't tell you exactly what that's going to look like because that's the nature of it. But that's what Paul is saying. That's the secret, though. That's the secret. To receive Him, not just as your Savior, but as your Lord, and then live your lives accordingly in step with the Spirit. You ready? Here, here's what I want you to do this week. Like each week, I want you to read this passage every day and maybe break it into these chunks as well like that would be helpful because I know it's like it can get boggy a little bit a little redundant a little repetitive and so just like take some breaks don't it doesn't have to be all you read but at least read this and read it every day I mean just the more you spend spend time just you know thinking about these things you'll you'll notice things I'm telling you you know, reading this more more than one time, it's like, oh, well, there's this. Ooh, I didn't notice that. Ooh, like I didn't catch the Lord thing the first couple of times through through it. That really, you know, came like after it, and I got back to that, and I was like, oh, that's that's kind of it. That's the it. That's the key. Read this every day, and then memorize two, six, and seven. Let's memorize that. I know, maybe you've never memorized a, a passage of Scripture before, and it's pretty short, and it's fairly easy. But let me recommend this. I like to use the NIV because I think it's um, complete enough and yet easy enough uh, to, to actually memorize passages uh, in, in NIV. But if you like NIRV a little bit better or New Living Translation or ESV or New King James, whatever it is, that's fine. But the goal is to actually memorize it, not to, you know, get frustrated by it, okay? So just, like, try memorizing it. Let's start there. And then, this is the kicker. Super simple, okay? Like, this is the, the dumbest objective. I can't even believe I'm saying it. But I think this could be a difference maker. Tell Jesus that he is your Lord. And this isn't a once a day, okay? And I think this, was, this one is like an out loud. And it could be under your breath, that's fine. But just like, Jesus, you're my Lord. Now, here's what I mean. I, I'm talking not once a day, but like when you, right when you get up in the morning, when you wake up, Jesus, you are my Lord. Right before you go to sleep at night, last thing, you put your phone down, say your prayers. Jesus, you are my Lord. Before you get in your car and you know that you're going to speed to work and flick somebody off, okay, <laughs> you go ahead and do that, okay? But before you do, just say, Jesus, you are my Lord, okay? It'd be a little tougher. Before you pick up another drink, before you open another can or bottle, before you take another dip, before you open another package, before you write that email or that text or make that phone call, just say, Jesus, you are my Lord. And then do it. 
and just see how easy it is then. Because here, I like to add, I've been trying this since yesterday. You know, I was like, I wasn't gonna, I, was, I thought I'd test it out on myself. And it makes decisions a little bit more difficult when you're saying, Jesus, you are my Lord. You are, my decisions are your decisions. Oh, I'm not so sure I'm gonna flick that guy off now because like, my decisions are your decisions. Would he actually do that? Uh, I'm not going to say Jesus is, is my Lord right now. I'm just going to skip it. And that's fine. At some point, though, just I, I, you, you'll have had that thought, though, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. This is what I mean. This is the difference of being, of being prompted, of, of allowing the Spirit inside of you to, to cue you, to, to, to give you your cues, to, to, to lead you, to guide you, to, for, for God to be Lord not just your savior, it means lit- that's really what he's talking about here. Like, it's not, well, did I, did I go to church and read my Bible and say my prayers? But, but did, did I do the homework that Tripp told me to do? No, it's, did, did God's spirit lead and guide and direct every decision I made this week? Probably not. I guarantee you, I get, if you, this might be one of those things that's worth just doing, like making a practice, like honestly, because it will make things, it will bring some things into perspective, you know, like when you're one, before I yell at my children, Jesus, you are my Lord, now come here, <laughs> you know, but just say that first. I mean, how hard is this? Like, that's just ridiculous. Okay. We're not going to get this right all the time. There is no perfection. We've been made complete in Christ, but we're not perfect in Christ. We're complete as in we're in a relationship with our Heavenly Father. That's been restored. But to make Him Lord of your life is just to say, I am, I'm not trying to do everything on my own. What I'm trying to do is to allow you to lead. That's the only way. I, I don't even know how to say it another way. I know that doesn't come like in a nice fancy box and is not perfect and, you know, you can digest it and check boxes, but, but this, I think this is what a relationship looks like. Your wife or your husband, your best friends, your kids, they don't want check boxes for you. They just want to know that you think about them, that you care, that you love them, that you're willing to say things, do things that... Show you care, right? I mean, that's, that's what you're looking for, and it's not always perfect, and we don't always hit the bullseye on that, but, but it's a relationship, and that's what this needs to look like. As you allow Jesus not just to be your Savior, but to be your Lord, to lead and guide and direct those decisions, and every step you take to stay in step with His Spirit. Would you bow your heads? I just want to pray for us um, because as simple as this homework is, I know what it really means for us. I know how difficult this can be to like really implement something like this. And, and I'm si- like, I'm so serious. Like, let's try this as a, as a people, as the body of Christ who desire deeply to stay connected to the head, Jesus. Let's try this. I think it's worth it. Heavenly Father, here's what I'm going to say. I'm just, I'm praying right now for every person in this room or maybe who's watching at home, wherever we are in our walk, in our spiritual journey, whether we're following you or not following you yet, and we're just toying with the idea wherever we are my my prayer is that we would hear these words with an open heart for some it may just it it may just be starting with Jesus you're my savior but at some point for all of us it needs to be Jesus you're my Lord and that's my prayer for us this week that we would hear exactly what you desire of us to just relinquish control 
to, to let go of the reins, to l let the one who is in charge, to actually be in charge, to continue to stay connected to the head who is Jesus. Would you, would you give us the wisdom to be able to do that? But then the courage to follow through, to actually follow through, to try these things. And, and we get, when we get frustrated, to get right back up and to try it again. Because ultimately, it's about you rooting us in you. It's you building us up in you. It's you strengthening our faith as we've been taught. Now, that's what we desire. It's about you. You start this relationship and you end this relationship. You are the author and perfecter of our faith. So we trust you with this. We glorify you in this. May our lives reflect that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.